You know, the Bible says to come boldly, Mm. not sheepishly, not timidly, boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. All right, let's put that aside. But listen to the next words, to obtain grace to help. See, grace is empowerment. Grace to help in a time of need. There is need in your world of influence. Mm. And if you tap into this grace, God will increase your world of influence. So if you look at Daniel, Daniel was not a preacher. Daniel was a government leader. Now Daniel is taken out of this little tiny country and brought in the most powerful nation of the world, Babylon. Babylon's not like the United States. It's much greater. I mean, Babylon's number one in the arts, in education, in the military, in economics, in in all sectors of life. America's like number 16 in education in the world. So you can't think America. He's brought into this nation. The king interviews him and his three friends, and the king determines he's 10 times smarter, wiser, more innovative and creative than their very best leaders in Babylon. Daniel starts coming up with ideas, and he starts getting promoted like crazy, right? And, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it actually says this in Daniel 6, verse 3, that Daniel distinguished himself among the other government leaders of Babylon because he had an excellent spirit. Now, can you imagine the other government leaders? They're scratching their heads. They're going, we have, we have been taught by the finest scientists, the most knowledgeable teachers and leaders in the world. These three guys or four guys have come out of this little country. Where are they getting these ideas from? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does this cause them to do? It causes them to start saying, wait a minute, there's something here with this man's God. Now, if you listen to Jesus' words, I don't know how we miss this. Jesus said, let your light shine that men may see your good works that they're wrought in God, not hear your good scriptures. So if you look at Daniel, Daniel is an Old Testament prophet, even though he's a government worker. He's not a minister. I mean, we hear prophet, we think he's a preacher. No, he's a government worker. Jesus said nobody's greater than John the Baptist up to that point, which makes John greater than Daniel. But then Jesus said, The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John, which makes the least in the kingdom of heaven. So I don't care if you're a stay-at-home mom right now, okay? You're greater than Daniel. So the question I have is, why aren't we taught to distinguish ourselves? Let me give you an example. If I'm a third grade teacher, I should be coming up with the most innovative and creative ways of communicating wisdom and knowledge that's causing the rest of the teachers in my school scratch their heads going, where in the world is she getting this from? It gets the attention of the principal, gets the attention of the superintendent. If I'm a hairstylist, I'm coming up with the most, why why is Paul Mitchell coming up with all these styles? Why aren't I coming? See, my Bible says we're the head, not the tail. Where I come from in Colorado, I have seen mountain lions in my backyard. I have news for you. That tail is not leading that lion. The head is. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we the most creative, innovative people? Because we've not been trained that this is our calling. Now, and here's where it really gets Conspiracy theory, okay? (laughs) No, it's not. Um, Kinda. This is the mainstream thought, and I I want every one of you to listen to me carefully, okay? Because I I want you to think this through. This is the mindset of almost every Christian out there. If I'm godly, if I treat people with kindness, and you know, I'm I'm a good Christian, the gifts of God on my life will automatically operate. No. That's, that is so not true. Wow. One of the most godly men in the whole New Testament is Timothy. Paul writes to the entire Philippian church and said, I have not found a man more Christ-like, godly in character, who doesn't seek his own but the things of Christ Jesus than Timothy. But yet he has to write later two separate letters saying, Timothy, your God-given gift is not engaged. It's not wow. working. So in other words, if, Timoth- if godliness automatically stirs up the gift or engages the gift is a better way of putting it, Timothy would have had it engaged to the max. But his was dormant. So here's where I really get concerned. Paul makes the statement in Romans 12, 6, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another, Right? according to the grace of God, all right? Having gifts then differing according to the grace, let us use them, is is actually the exact quote from the New King James. All right, the Greek word for grace is charis. 10 years ago, a nationwide survey was done. Over 5,000 Christians, we're talking born again, Bible-believing Christians, got this survey. And they said, give three or more one-word definitions of grace. Here's the top three results. Salvation, 
a free unmerited gift, forgiveness of sins, and the fourth answer was the love of God. Here's the tragedy of this survey. Less than 2% of those 5,000 said that grace is God's empowerment. Yet God himself speaks red letter in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 to the Apostle Paul and says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power. God refers to his grace as his power works best in your weakness, which is our human inability. Wow. Wow. Paul said, I labored more than any other apostle. It wasn't me, it was the grace of God in me. It was empowerment. Peter says, grace be multiplied to you as his divine power has given everything we need for a godly life. Wow. So here's the problem. And, 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 and I want every one of you to listen to me. The work that God created you to do before you were began, according to Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, it is impossible for you to fulfill that calling in your own ability. Wow. How how do I know that? Here's how I know that. God makes the statement, I will never share my glory with anyone. So God on purpose makes our calling beyond our natural ability so that he'd get all the glory. So God on purpose did that so we'd have to depend on grace to fulfill it. Now, You can only have from God what you believe and you cannot believe what you don't know. So if 98% of the Christians in America don't know that grace empowers me to go beyond my natural ability, that means 98% of the Christians in America are living according to their own ability and they're not fulfilling the call of God upon their life because you can't do it except by the supernatural gifting. Now, when I understood this, this changed everything. This is why Lisa and I started really saying, okay, God, we're not, we're not gonna live in our own ability. We're gonna live outside, we're gonna live by the grace. So let, let's, take it, let's take it a step further. Having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. The word gifts, you know what's interesting? If you take the Greek word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, and you put an M and an A on it, okay. you get the word for gifts. What is charisma? It is the specific gift of grace that God's placed upon our life that gives us the ability to fulfill what we're called to do. One of mine would be writing. Most people listening to us right now don't realize that English and writing was my worst subject in high school. Wow. I scored 370 on the SAT, 370 on the English. In all my travels, I've only met two human beings that scored lower than 370 on the English, and one guy, it's because he guessed at all the answers. He was so mad he didn't study for the test, and he didn't know it was going to be that hard. So he said, John, you really can't count me. Now, When God comes to me in 1991 and said, son, I want you to write. I said, okay, you have so many kids on this planet, you're getting us mixed up with one another. You don't want me to write. Talk to my English teacher. So I did nothing because I assumed his silence was his affirmation of my rebuttal. (laughs) But 10 months later, two different women came to me within two weeks of each other and they both said the exact same words. They said, John Bevere, if you do not write what God is giving you to write, he will give the message to somebody else. And one day you'll stand in judgment for it. When the second woman from Texas said it two weeks after the first woman in Florida, the fear of God hit me. So I get a note, this is 1991. I get a notebook piece of paper and I take a Sharpie and I write contract. I wrote a contract with God. I said, God, I think you're making a huge mistake. It took me four (laughs) hours to write a two page paper in English, right? In high school, I can't write, I need grace and I signed the contract. Now, I had no idea what I was doing because back then I saw grace as salvation, a free gift and forgiveness of sins. I didn't realize it was empowerment to give me the ability to go beyond my natural ability. So now I look at today, the books are in the tens of millions. They are in over a hundred, they are in 129 languages. I'm the most published author in Vietnam, secular or Christian. I could go on and on with all these other nations. And so I look at these books and I realize my name's on it because I was the first guy to get to read it because it was the gift of God on me that did it. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.